story is very while their love story is very unique and special to our family, I do want to present it as a microcosm of life embodiment during the war and as representative of the lives of men like my mom and my dad, servicemen and future war brides. Therefore, I will frame my story with a little bit of information about my dad's war unit and um, some common experiences for war brides. I've been to England many, many times um, since my mom brought me as a child. And I think it's kind of ironic that um, I've never, I've been all over Cornwall and Devon, but I've never been to uh, Bodmin. And I think for the purposes of this talk, it's almost destiny because the Bodmin that I have in my mind is the Bodmin of my mom's stories. Um, it's been augmented a little bit by the pictures that uh, I've discovered through Mary and Charlotte. And I think it will make my visit when I finally get there, hopefully real soon, much richer. Um, my mom was quite a storyteller. She could hold court when she tells stories. And I hope that I can just be half the storyteller my mom was. But rarely did she tell stories in a chronological fashion. So the irony is, you know, I have all these scenes in my head. And um, as I was trying to prepare this talk, I kept thinking about a toy I used to play with and I found it on eBay. It's an old master view. And some of you probably played with them and you got reels and you stuck them in and whatever the topic was, you got to see seven scenes. So I thought, you know, that's really how I see the year that my mom and dad courted while they were in Bodmin. I, I have all these various scenes in my head. So that's how I am going to organize my talk. Um, how did my parents meet? Well, my dad's journey was obviously a lot longer than my mom's. Um, first of all, he, uh, he was a part of the 29th Infantry. And in February of 1941, President Roosevelt activated what was the Maryland, Virginia and DC National Guard. And the National Guard in this country is like an army reserve. And so they got activated for a year but then Pearl Harbor happened and that year turned into five years. And during that time, my dad at the age of 23 joined the army. Uh, and he, you know, obviously trained with them for about six months. And then the whole unit, about 20,000 of them were sent over in the fall of 42. They came on to two boatloads. Uh, the first was the Queen Mary that left late September. And the second was the Queen Elizabeth in early October of 1942. And they docked in Greenock, Scotland. And my dad was on the second. Um, rather than my tell you about the 29th, I have a recording of a friend of my father. His name was Hugh Gallagher. And Hugh lived to be over 100. And he was with the 110th Field Artillery. Uh, and he was a medic. And I took mom out to have lunch with him and being the sneaky lady that I am, I put the tape recorder on. And um, the story I remember about Hugh was that they asked him in 1998 if he wanted to be a special guest at the premiere of Saving Private Ryan and the film. And Hugh said, no, thank you. Uh, seen it once, I don't need to do that again. So I thought you might enjoy hearing my mom's voice and Hugh talk a little bit. Very fondly. We left England. Sorry, I'll start. Okay. We went to Bodmin. Okay. And then, well, I yeah. met Frank in Bodmin. See, that's when I met him, when you were in Bodmin. Yeah. And that was. We in, spent. We spent about over a year in Bodmin. We left England for France in 44. And came home in 45. Home 45, we went to France, Belgium, Holland, 
in Germany. Yeah, yeah. They were, I mean, we were never all together at one no. point. Well, on the road. We, were, we were spread out all over the place. So as Hugh tells you, um, when they docked in Scotland, they didn't spend very long there. They wound up very quickly, most of them down in Tidworth uh, in Wilkeshire. And they spent about seven months doing training there. And at this time, my dad was sent to Oxford to be a radio man. My mother wound up at Oxford later. So we used to joke that my parents went to Oxford. Um, but in 1943, in May of 43, the 20,000 men of the 29th were all moved down to Cornwall and Devon. And about 2,000 of the men wound up in Bodmin. Um, and of course, they lived in the barracks there. And that would include my dad's 115th Infantry uh, Regimental Headquarters. And it also included Hugh Gallagher's 110th Field Artillery. On the 30th of May, 1943, um, Bodmin greeted the Americans. Um, and most of them were housed at the walk lines in back of what is Bodmin Keep today. On the 4th of July, um, the town had a nice 4th of July parade. And um, the 29ers at this time went through very realistic and intensive training. Part of my dad's training meant that he was sent to Liscard. Um, to a relay station. Mom explained that the radio signal was strong enough to go from Plymouth to Bodmin. So the men would take turns going out to list card uh, week on and week off. Um, and that plays into one of the scenes I'm going to talk about. In mid-May 1944, the men were moved to a marshalling area near Liscard, where they did the final preparations for D-Day, including things like waterproofing all the equipment. On the actual day of the invasion itself, the 29th Infantry uh, was part of the initial um, onslaught of Omaha. The 116th went in first, and they're the ones that are featured primarily in Saving Private Ryan, and they took the heaviest casualties. My dad's unit went in at about 10.30 in the morning, and the others went in the next day. And from the invasion until May 45, they fought seven campaigns through, as Hugh told you, France, Belgium, Holland, and Germany. How my mom got to Bodmin. Uh, when my mom turned 18, she wanted to see the world. Uh, she was from a small farming town in Trumley, in Devon, and uh, she, she did not want to stay in the village. So she wanted to join the Navy, but they wouldn't take her because she had had thyroid surgery. And uh, so instead she went to Plymouth and she did a six week training course uh, with the National Emergency Nursing Service. And so her first um, station was to Bodmin and she arrived around the same time as the Americans. And so that gave them the opportunity to have about, I would say almost a year, okay, of, of time to get to know each other. So scene one of, of our story, I called the meeting my mom had a friend called June Bailey, and she worked with her at the hospital. And she was dating another 29er called Charlie Citrow. Uh, he was from New York, and mom knew Charlie through June. And one day, walking on the main street, somewhere around here, 4th Street, she ran into Charlie and a fellow 29er, my dad. Um, they were headed up to the hospital, and mom was headed down to the Y. Anyway, a little later in the day, my mom was heading back up and my father was heading back down by himself. And uh, he stopped, said hello to her and said, do you wanna go for a drink? My mom had a date with a British PT guy, but she, uh, she stood him up, okay? She said he was a snob, so she didn't feel bad about that. And that's how my parents met. Scene two, uh, I called dating. And my mom wasn't much of a writer. So I asked her if she would record some of her memories. And there was a little clip that I thought you might enjoy hearing because she does talk about Bodmin. Well, they heard until they went over for the invasion, which was 44. I was working in the hospital and dating him. Oh, it wasn't much to do. You'd go to the small little movie theater or uh, 
go to the bar or take a walk and go in a bar and listen to the piano player. Uh, the, the movie theater was an old, antiquated movie theater. We showed old movies. But the night we all went there and they were asking if it was um, talent night, what they call talent night. And anybody thought they had some talent to get up and do what they wanted to do. So this guy that was with us, so nice, I can get him, but he was their mover. He got in the army, I think it was 10 or 14, by giving him a wrong age. His name was Billy Melander. Anyway, Billy got up and he recited something in <laughs> and you could have heard a pin drop. Because he went through the whole thing. So I, you know, I had asked mom what she did on her dates. Um, as you can see from the telegrams here, um, they didn't have text messages and iPhones. Um, and, uh, you know, they had some, obviously, some favorite meeting spots, so they must have communicated this way sometimes. Um, one of them is from the uh, New Year's Eve, okay, and uh, says, you know, I'll meet you at the back gate. But the other one says, I'll meet you at our usual. And we grew up with a story about how on a dark night, and I didn't really know this story was in Bodmin, but it had to have been because it was the only chance they would have had the kind of time. Um, they had a favorite meeting spot, which was the bench. And so they had agreed to meet there. And I imagine it must have been somewhere between the camp and the hospital and somewhat secluded. And it was an extremely dark, moonless night and with all the blackouts. Supposedly one sat on one end of the bench and one sat on the other. And the next, they didn't see each other. And the next day it was, where are you and where are you? So we laughed about that story. Um, both mom and dad often spoke about using Red Cross facilities during the war. And when Charlotte found this photo and shared it with me of the American donut dugout located at 74th Street uh, with my dad's love of donuts and my mom's sweet tooth, I can pretty much guarantee that made a few visits there. Uh, scene three, I called the Palace Theater, and Mom talked about it a little bit on that clip. The theater she referenced here would have been the old Palace Theater, which is now a charity shop. While part of the old theater roof remains inside, the front entrance was demolished in 1988. In 1943, the building was owned by a man called Leslie G. Hill, and he used to show old movies here. Okay, I think things like Gary Cooper and Ingrid Bergman. And he ran some local events, such as a Boxing Day celebration on December the 27th, 1943, with Billy Edmonds and a dance band. On September the 9th, 1943, it's likely my parents attended a night of all American entertainment sponsored by Mr. Hill and held in the public rooms to benefit the Bodmin Prisoners of War Fund. There was a cross-section of American music and a quartet and some hillbilly music. But can you imagine a talent night with a poetry recitation? Maybe somebody should try this on Britain's Got Talent. Written in 1890 by Rudyard Kipling, Gunga Din is told from the point of view of a British soldier in India. In, India. in the poem, the men argue over the best drink for British soldiers. Beer or gin? Ganga Din is an Indian water carrier for the soldiers, and they look down on him as a servant, as an inferior. And when the narrator is wounded and aided by Ganga Din, suddenly he views this man very differently as the poem shifts from comic and derisive to a tragic end. And uh, I'd like you to look at the ceiling and close your eyes and imagine it's 1943. And a New Yorker named Billy Melander with a British accent and all draws his performance to a close as he concludes with the poem's well-known last line. I shall forget the night when I fell behind the fight with a bullet where me no plate should have been. I was choking mad with thirst. The man who signed me first was a good old pretty drunken Dungadine. 
He lifted up me and he brought me where I bled. He gave me half a pint of water. Green. <laughs> it was crawled and it stunk. But of all the drinks I've drunk, I'm grateful as to that one from Dunga Dean. I was Dean. Dean, Dean, there's a bloke with a bullet in his spleen. He's crawling at the ground. He's kicking all around. For God's sake, get the water, Gunga Dean. He carried me away to where the doodle lay. A bullet come through the beggar clean. He placed me safe inside just before he died. I hope you write your drink, says Gunga Dean. So I'll meet him later on in the place where he has gone. But it's always double drilled and no canteen. He'll be swatting on the coast, give a drink to poor damn souls. And I'll get a swig of hell from them to Dean. Dean, 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 you last rushing leather gunga Dean. Though I belted you and flayed you. By the living God that paid you, you're a better man than I am, Gunga Dean. I need to give credit to a man named Bill Spitz. I found that on YouTube, and it was an open mic night, ironically, in Maryland, which is maybe, you know, where the unit was from. And um, it was in 2014, so he gets some credit for that. Uh, my mom told um, this same Billy Melander could be found at dances, throwing girls over his shoulder as he jitterbugged. And as we shall see in another scene in the story, he liked to entertain local children at Christmas parties. Uh, scene four, I call Liscard and St. Clair. Two of my dad's photos show that the guys were sent to this area and they formed strong bonds with some of the locals, especially the children. These two photos were in my dad's album and the identifications are in his handwriting. Mrs. Burchell, a real mother to all of us fellows on the left front, McDermott, one of our boys, and Iris. Back row, Mrs. Burchell's daughter, Nora, and Valerie and Maureen. And the second photo, our company's pride and joy, Maureen seated in the Jeep and Valerie on the hood. Don't you think that they are sweet? A scrapbook belonging to one of my dad's friends named Frank George was passed along to me and it contained a letter of, by one of the students in a Miss Harwood's class. It was sent, one, it was sent to one of the men um, it, after they had shipped out and were in Europe. And from the content, the letter was likely written in July of 1944. St. Clair, Liscard, dear Yankee friends, we're all sorry to hear that you're in France. We hope you will look after yourselves. I expect you want to come home to Cornwall again, but still you will one day. We always miss seeing you up there on the downs when we are let out in the afternoon. We all liked your Christmas party that you gave us. We enjoyed it very much, but we needn't worry much because we all know that the war will soon be over with all you Yanks over there. We would like to write much more, but we don't want you to get in trouble. But mind you, kill a nice lot of Jerry's. Once again, we hope the war will soon end before next Christmas so that you make a home to your own home and have a good Christmas dinner so that you can give your own children a Christmas party. Miss Harwood, our teacher, just asked us to put that she wishes you the best of luck, only she can't write very well because she is so busy, as we are breaking up for a month's holiday this Friday. <laughs> we heard that some of you are out of Normandy into Brittany. I am an evacuee from London because of the bombs. Now don't forget to look after yourselves. Cheerio, boys, from Kathleen Friend. Keep smiling with kisses. Notice that the letter speaks of a Christmas party. In the Cornish Guardian on the 30th of December, 1943, it reports about two Christmas parties. The one on the 23rd was given at St. Clair, 
where the children were entertained by the US Army, community singing, solos by soldiers, and a USA bugler. The quote, a USA bugler was a great favor with all present with his recitations. But of course, not even Billy Melander could compete with the arrival of Father Christmas, who brought presents and sweeties. And the article also mentioned Miss Harwood. So this is the teacher in the letter. Uh, on the 24th of December, they gave a party for 500 children under the age of 12 in Bodmin itself. U.S. Army Band and Chorus, okay, Father Christmas, and likely Billy Melander. Scene five. I call this engagement day. One day while in town, dad guided mom into a local jeweler shop. Likely it was called Zimbers. And it was located at 4th Street, which is now where Livingston's is. After purchasing a ring, they walked over to the town hall where he presented her the ring on the staircase between the ground and the second floor. Mom said the Y was on the second floor. Some of the more able patients were in town that day and had seen them leaving the jewelers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Once back at the hospital, Mom went on duty only to hear, what kind of a ring did he buy you, nurse? Loud enough for everybody to hear. The matron was sorely disappointed because she thought my mother should marry a British soldier. Scene six, at the hospital, mid-May, 1944. That picture is actually Christmas. Mom's friend, Joyce Pengelly, named Penny, had spent her day off with a 29er that she was dating called Barry Underwood. Joyce was late getting back for a night shift. She rushed in and she threw a letter at my mother. As mom opened it, a whole bunch of torn pictures fell onto the bed. While mom was reading the letter, Joyce was busy putting the pictures back together like a jigsaw puzzle. Dad had torn up all the photos of his old girlfriends from Philadelphia to prove to mom she was the only one for him. The note said that he would meet her at the gate at, and to the camp if she could get there. Despite being late for her shift, Joyce was absorbed in her task with the photo pieces. Quote, he had some good lookers in his day. What does he see in you? She said. Meanwhile, the guys were packing up to move from Biden into the marshalling area. As mom rushed down to the camp, she ran into another friend of my father's named Cliff Bailey, and she yelled, how you doing, Cliff? And he replied, not great. I think I have channelitis. Scene seven, go to Penny's. Ten days to two weeks after the men were moved to the marshalling area, near Liscard for the final preparations, mom got a note saying, if you and Penny get to Penny's house, which happened to be near Liscard, we might be able to see you. The girls had the day off, so mom and Penny put on their uniforms. <laughs> Ever resourceful, my mother thought if they wore their nurse's uniform, they'd have a better chance of getting a lift so they wouldn't have to walk the 12 to 14 miles to Liscard. All the trains and buses and every form of transportation, mom said, was off limits to civilians at that time. Everything was dedicated to moving the military at this point. Lucky for them, somebody recognized Penny, picked them up. And when they got there, the guys were surprised. They said, how'd you get here? Some cute guy picked us up, mom said. Hey, Barry, what do you think? Shall we throw them out? Said my father. We went to the movies in Liscard that night, or they went to the movies in Liscard that night. And the guys hustled, but the next day, the guys hustled a taxi to take the girls back to Bodmin and then back to the marshalling area. <clears throat> that was the last time that they were together before the invasion and until my dad came back to England a year later. After Bodmin, my mom, very soon after the invasion, was sent to Stratton St. Margaret in, near Swindon to a clearing station where she handled burn victims that still had battle dressings. She said that the <clears throat> clearing station was open for a few months, but by the beginning of January, 1945, <coughs> she had transferred to Oxford to begin more formal nurses training at the Wingfield Morris Orthopedic Hospital. 
While she was in Oxford, she was interviewed by a Catholic chaplain as part of a very lengthy process to marry an American soldier. Dad finally got 10 days leave in early June, 1945. He rushed to Oxford and from there they rushed to Barnstable because you needed three days in advance with a, with a marriage license. From Barnstable, they went to Chumley and then the day before they were to get married, mom hustled up some coupons and went to Exeter to buy a practical outfit, not a bridal outfit. And dad went down to Liscard to see a priest's friend named Father Andres, who kindly gave him a bottle of altered wine as a wedding present. That night, they were to meet in Exeter to take the train back to Chumley, but my dad missed the train, took a later one, I'm sure. But my grandmother said to my mother when she got home, see, I told you, you can't trust those Americans. He's jilted you. On the 12th of June, 1945, my parents were married in Barnstable. The next night they went to Exeter and they wanted to stay at the Rougemont Hotel, but the hotel would not rent to soldiers and young English women. And so the taxi driver took them to a lady's house that he knew and she kindly let them use her front parlor. And then they had two days at a hotel in London before dad had to ship back to Germany. <coughs> He did manage to get back to England briefly, right before he shipped home in September of 1945. Mom followed six months later on a ship called the E.B. Alexander, and she was one of 70,000 English war brides, part of the largest immigration of women in U.S. history. In a newspaper article in 1946, a chaplain who had been with a unit said that 10% of his men in the unit married British women. While each of these women and their situations were unique and special, they did have some very common bonds, um, threads that ran throughout their stories. Most of them were still in school when the war began. My mom was 14 in 1939. Many did not know the men very long. A woman named Florence Baker from St. Day in Cornwall met her future 29er husband while she was waiting for a bus in the rain one Friday night. And the next Friday night, got engaged and got married three months later. Many endured long periods of separation. A Margaret Harris from Bear Alston, north of Plymouth, got engaged to a Paul Stackowitz, who was also a 29er. In May of 1944, Paul would not marry before the invasion and they did not see each other for three years. She finally came to New York in August of 47, and they married in September. Many had marriages arranged quickly and under stressful conditions. Some probably married out of necessity, as was likely the case with a 20-year-old Lena Bos Boswell of Bodmin. Her marriage photo in the Western Morning News in April of 44 showed her sister handing the bride a horseshoe for good luck as her US Army husband, Edward Spencer, looked on. Sadly, Lena died six months later, partly due to complications from a miscarriage on June the 8th, 1944, two days after the invasion. All of these women went through a complex process with numerous forms, interviews, investigations. The US military, the men had to have the approval of their commanding officer, to marry at the being court-martialed. For most brides and their young children, there was the final hurdle. It was Tidworth that had been turned into a processing center. Here, the, war, the brides were subjected to humiliating physical exams, followed by lengthy waits for military-arranged ship transports while living in less than luxurious conditions. And then the journey. My mom said hers was rough when the E.B. Alexander, even she was seasick and most of them experienced bouts with it. The rules and regulations showed that this was not a luxury cruise. The women had to be up at 8 a.m., room inspection at 10 a.m., lights out at 11, no alcohol, no drinking, no switching rooms, but there was a contest for the cutest baby and the most handsome husband. Upon arrival in the new world, many brides faced realities unlike what they had envisioned. 
But one statistic said that 80% of these marriages survived, as did my parents for 50 years until my dad's death in 1995. Mom passed 10 days after their 75th wedding anniversary. I like to think that dad convinced God that 25 years apart was long enough. He wanted his English bride at last. Thank you very much, Susan. That was very lovely. Um, and we were, I'm sure everyone else can agree that that was very touching at the end and very moving as well. And I'm sure you would have made your parents very proud. I hope. Yeah. I'm sure they would be very yeah. proud of you. And I'm sure they're looking down on you today. One on one side and one on the other. <laughs> yeah. There you go. They were, they were um, special and I was blessed. Yeah. As are you. Um, so first of all, so we've got some guests in the room, Susan. So I wondered if anyone in the room has any questions? I've never done Zoom before. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't done much. I can ask Susan for you. Uh, so. That's what I told you, really. Um, so we've got a lady in the room, uh, Susan, who's, is it your? My, my dad's father was a black GI. Was a black GI uh, based in Cornwall during the war. Okay. Um, but you don't know I don't, know, I don't have any information. Don't have any information. So we've got a personal kind of link to the story here today. Um, just that my grandma's was from Jula near Lascard and she was working away in Lou. And that's where she met him at a tea dance. Well, if you want to connect us, I'm a, I'm a good sleuth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on Ancestry. What's I'm that? on Ancestry. I'm on Ancestry, but I haven't been able to find... I'm on Ancestry. Yes. I do answer, but I haven't been able to find any information because we don't have any name or anything. Oh, you don't know his name? No, we don't have any in the information. No. Have you, if you've, if, you, if you've done the DNA. I've done the DNA. All right. I don't, I don't have. Why don't you get Charlotte to give you my email? I, I'm on Ancestry too, and I've played with the DNA. It's interesting. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> Go. Okay. Ready? Any other questions in the room? Susan? Yeah. It's not so much a question yeah. as a comment. Um, some years back, I met somebody in Bodmin who was in an orphanage and I was having a really tough time there in the war in Bodmin. And he said the one bright point in his entire time in the orphanage was when the GIs had a big picnic up on the beacon and entertained all the local children and gave them all presents oh. and sweets. <laughs> and he had come, he didn't emigrate to Australia after the war and had come back with his son to show him where he'd been. And he said that, that he'd never forgotten all the GIs oh. and how wonderful they were to the kids from the orphanage. Yeah, and that's, um, that's something we hear a lot, isn't it, Susan, about the rations. I've heard a lot talking, that's something that, that sticks a lot with the children in terms of just the food, even, that they would give out a lot of um, candy to the kids and they would become, quickly become their favourite. <laughs> I, I think they love the kids. I mean, you could tell my father loved those two little girls at Liscard. Yeah, definitely. Um, I don't know if anybody... Oh, hang on, we got a question here from an audience member. Does Susan plan on visiting Bodmin in the near future? If so, what is she looking forward to doing the most? Uh, I'm going to track down all of these sites. Obviously, I will visit the hospital. Uh, uh, Mary has promised, well, Charlotte says she'll come back uh, from London, but I've got Mary committed to a cup of tea at the donut dugout that's supposed to be turned into a cafe. <laughs> Um, and I have talked to Mary about there is nothing inside the museum that honors these men. So I um, have some archival experience. I volunteer here in Pennsylvania, and I would love nothing more than to have at least some little corner of that museum honor the men. And if I can be a part of doing anything for that, that would be um, it would be a real thrill and it would be a nice way to honor, I think, my father and and the fact that so many men spend a year of their lives there. But yes, and I'm hoping it'll be in the spring. You go. Um, I don't know if we've got any more questions from in the audience. Anyone want to unmute or write a message in the chat? 
No. Well, I guess actually I I've can't see people. So, but I've never asked you, Susan. But I do. I do wonder um, why they decided to move to America. Do you know why they didn't stay in Cornwall? Why they decided to go over to the states? Well, I've lost your visual. Um, have you lost mine? No, I can see you. Oh, okay, wait. Uh, all right, well, I, that, it's disconcerting not seeing anything. Um, well, I, you know, I think most of these war, war brides came stateside. And obviously my father, my father was here um, and mom had a wanderlust. My mother did not want to stay in a small village. She want, She always said, I wanted to live in a city. I wanted to see a big city. So I don't think there was much argument that she wanted to see the world. And, um, you know, I was very blessed. She, they didn't, they didn't have a lot, but he promised that I, you know, he said to my grandparents, we'll get her back when we can. And she worked part-time as a nurse, even when I was a child. And saved enough that she brought, I have a sister and I, I had a brother, and she took each of us twice as children. So she managed to get us all over to know our grandparents. And, um, you know, so she kept that bond very strong. Um, and, you know, I'm glad she did that. A lot of them came and lost that bond. I would, I remember looking forward to that Christmas parcel every year. We'd save it and open it on Christmas Day from England and with our sweeties and stuff. So, uh, it, you know, in many ways, it made growing up um, different, in some ways happier, in some ways sadder. It, it opened up the world for me, but my father's family was very small and my mother's family was very big. And so the ir irony was I had more family overseas than I have here. And that's still the case. Um, so, you know, on holidays, they were not around and for birthdays, they were not around. Yeah. So in, in that sense, um, you know, now with it wasn't until the 70s that they started to come over here. Um, and, and then it was slow. And in, it, but of course, in the last 10, 20 years, it has certainly been more frequent with the younger ones coming. And um, we thank God for, so much for Skype and FaceTime at the end, mom, you know, mom would FaceTime two, three times a week with, she was the old, she was one of six. And when she turned 90, they were all living, every one of them. Her oldest brother passed shortly after that. Um, the sad part about them living so long was we lost all three, we lost three within a year. So now there are only two left living. Once mom passed, her middle brother and middle sister um, passed shortly after. So I do have an aunt and uncle still living in Devon. But I have millions of cousins. So I think it, it, was, it wasn't even, a, I don't think they really talked about that very much. I think it was a given. Cool. Thank you. Well, I don't think we've got any more questions. Um, okay. But thank you very much again, Susan. That was very interesting. Thank you. Because through this, you've made me, um, you've really made me solidify the story in, in ways that I hadn't done. As I said, it was really a lot of bits and pieces. And, and now Bodman's much more real to me. <laughs> and I realized how much, how important that year was, because that was really their courting year. Um, they didn't have much time to court after he left. And, you know, they saw each other briefly, but their courtship was all in Bodmin. Well, thank goodness he made it through. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm glad of that, too. Anyway, I, so I thank you for the opportunity. No, thank you very much, Susan.